Okay, over the last few um, videos, really the last two, um, there, there's there been a, a real emphasis on the rational and uh, the reasoned and these great philosophical ideas that end up in Christian theology. Here, uh, we, we're going to make a little bit of a return to the numinous. Remember our Mesopotamian friends who are a little bit more about the experience. This will be a little bit of a return uh, for us as well. Uh, theologically to our desert fathers and um, some of these more mystic and spiritual components to Christian theology. Uh, what we want to try and highlight here is in this return, though, there's still really good, really deep, really high quality theology. And so we, we want to kind of tease that out here a little bit. But we want to do so by doing justice to their experience and their approach to Christian theology. And this isn't um, an intentional sort of overreaction against that, that rational dominance in Christian theology. Um, I think it's a, a movement of God in these uh, women's lives that uh, is starting to try and balance some of that super rationalistic Christian theological thing out with um, remembering that God is relational and we exist in relationship with him and we, we can't be so heavy-handed on, uh, on the, the, the rational and the theoretical and the theological that we lose the experience of God. So we're going to talk about two really key women um, in, in Christian theological circles um, and their experiences and their theologies that grow out of that experience. Uh, those two ladies are going to be Julian of Norwich and Catherine of Siena. Now, both um, had, um, had rather unique, let's put it that way, rather unique encounters uh, with God and uh, really argued theologically from those encounters. Uh, Julian of Norwich writes a, a text titled Revelations of Divine Love, in which she records uh, a total of 16 experiences she had, in, uh, she calls revelations of, um, of God's love, explaining uh, in, the, in the revelations of divine love how these things that have been revealed to her matter sort of theologically. And, and matter for the practice of Christian life and faith, okay? Uh, first and foremost for Julian of Norwich, God is a relational God. And love exists between the God who created us and us as his creature, as his creation. And this relationship, this relationship is the primary vehicle through which God speaks to us. We engage with God in prayer and spiritual discipline, we engage with God as he gives us revelations, as he provides us with experience of his presence, of his essence and his nature. And she has some firsthand knowledge of this. Her 16 revelations recorded in the revelation of divine love are, are foundational to her theology of this relational dynamic between God and us between creator and creation. But it's this love, this pure love, this divine love of God that is fundamentally theological for her. The, the numinous experience of the power in the encounter of the divine for Julian of Norwich is not like our Mesopotamian numinous, sort of daunting, lording over the people uh, experience of the divine. For Julian, the experience of the divine is love. It is a relational tenderness, uh, a kind of kindness, a kind of willing the best for us in the love that God has for us, okay, that, that doesn't strike us in awe or fear or we should be subject to him because he's going to squish us like bugs. It's a theology centered around this. God wills what is best and good and, and what is loving toward us because he loves us. And that necessitates 
this relationship whereby we get to be loved by God and love God in return. She's an experiential theologian. Okay? The human soul is loved by God so specially and so specifically, so individually, that there isn't knowledge to explain the love of God. It is, in effect, ineffable, unexplainable. And where our, uh, our past theologians thought out ways to rationally explain the God of the universe, Julian of Norwich is trying to remind us that there are things about God, like the divine love, that we cannot rationally reason out and fully explain or understand. They can only be understood by the means of experience. Remember, in Proverbs, there is this idea that there are certain things we know in wisdom and we know with God only because we experience them. This experiential knowledge of the world around us. Um, not only is it true theologically, it's true of our lives. There are, there are only things we know by experience in relationship with other people. I really only know love from myself to my wife and from my wife to me in the relational dynamic of our marriage. And that's the same kind of thing that Julian of Norwich is really talking about when she talks about these relational dynamics between the human soul and the God who created that human soul. It is only in the back and forth of love exchanged between God and us that we fully understand. And not even that. We don't really fully understand it. But it's only in that relational experience, that relationship dynamic, that we understand at all what the love of God is. It's not something that we can reason out. We can talk about it as willing the best for the other. But it has to be experienced. We have to encounter it. We have to come to a place where the, the, the divine breaks into our reality and confronts us with love to fully come to grips with the fact that our rational explanations cannot explain the divine. We only can experience some of that element of the divine. We can explain a lot about God. But Julian is reminding us there is a lot that we cannot explain and there are things that must be experienced in the context of relational encounters of God's essence, nature, divinity. And it's only in the experience of God that we understand. It's only in the experience of God that we realize those elements that are fully inexplainable. And that's okay. We don't have to have detailed out answers for every theological detail. We need to be able to understand that sometimes it's my spiritual experience and practice through which God reveals truth like the divine love and the fact that God is love. Now, Catherine of Siena uh, stands much in the same vein. However, she reaches back to our monastic friends a little bit. She reaches back to our desert fathers a little bit more. And she says that people should let their wills be good and holy. We should desire, those who follow Christ, we should desire to get rid of our perverted and selfish tendencies of the will so that we can be wholly subject to the will of Christ. And this is the work of God, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctifying the lives of His people. This removal of us being subject to a will that is not 
the will of God, the will of Christ, the will of the Holy Spirit. And so we, in our prayer, in our contemplation, in our partnership with God, should be moving toward a place where it is not my will at work, it is the will of God at work. And we should be stripping away those things that get in the way of the will of God being realized in my life. And in this way, although she's pretty poignant on, on uh, these are things that must be experienced in the relationship between human beings and God, she does sound a little bit like our Stoic friends. We have to find a way to strip away those things that interfere with the will of Christ made manifest through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But for Catherine, it's not an assertion of my will to do that. It's a replacement of my will and an experience of the good and holy will of Christ. And so I work and I discipline myself to see my will come to be good and holy as I engage my will with the will of Christ and in the experience of this partnership, the experience of this relationship between us and God, we find ourselves in our experience of that relationship having our human wills supplanted, replaced by the will of God in the work of the Spirit in sanctification. And so we find ourselves becoming good and holy because we find ourselves in our relationship with God losing my will and finding Christ's will because we love God in return. Julian was focused primarily and, and in large part because these were her experiences on the love of God toward us. Catherine is focused on the response of love back to God. We know love for God because we experience love for God as a response to God's love for us and in relationship, in partnership with God. And because it is a loving relationship, we surrender our will in recognition that what God wills for me is out of love and is better for me than what I will for myself. And so I surrender and I cast aside my will to let it become good and holy by the work of God in me. And I partner with God in the experience of my discipline, in the experience of my devotion, in the practice of my spirituality to find the good and holy in the will of God made real in mine, made manifest in my life. Okay? And so we subject voluntarily in my relationship with God, we subject our will to the will of Christ. We pray, as Christ did, not my will, but your will be done. It is the work of God in the lives of people to be partnered with us to see our will decrease and the will of God in our lives increase because God's love wills what is best for us. Our response to the love of God is to volunteer the surrender of our will daily to the will of of God because that is what is best that is what is holy and good and what is perfect for us and so there's a focus in Catherine on the will a little bit like there's a focus well a lot like there's a focus on the will in the Stoics but what makes Catherine different theologically is it's not the will subjecting the rest of life to the will it's my will replaced by the will of God, making me into what God calls me to be, 
transforming me, being at work. It is, in effect, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Be transformed. Passive imperative. I am to be changed, but I am only changed as I surrender to God, as I partner with God, as I enter into this loving relationship with God and set myself aside so that the will of God can be made real in my space. This marks sort of a complete circle here. The, these women are not neglecting the rational and neglecting the reasonable and, and the reasoned out sort of theological treatises of Christianity at this point. They are simply standing as reminders that this faith is something we are supposed to live out. And the primary method in which we live out that faith is in relationship and relationship with God. It is good to know these theological doctrines and to understand these philosophical truths. That is good, but it is even better to know those things and live in an experienced relationship with God where God loves us and we love God. And their reminder to us is there's still a place for the numinous power of of God to confront us, to transform us, to make us good and holy, to help us understand, despite the fact that we cannot understand, what is the love of God for us. And so it's only in our relationship and our experience with God that those rational truths begin to mean something for us. The truths about transcendence and the nature and makeup of the universe and the, the character and the nature and the person of God. Augustine, Anselm, Augustine, sorry, I just said Augustine twice, two different ways. Uh, Augustine, Anselm, and St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, reaching all the way back to Irenaeus and Origen, talking uh, about our desert fathers. Look, it all comes down to we need those truths, but we also need them in balance with the relational experience with the God that is good and holy, so that we can be the good and holy through relationship and through that which is not comprehensible, not understandable by us, but only can be known by experience of the divine.